I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to the Bigfoot Project. Dennis Lloyd Martin, born June 20, 1962, is an American child who disappeared on June 14, 1969, in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in Tennessee at the age of six. The search effort was the most extensive in the park's history, involving approximately 1,400 searchers and a 56-square-mile area. It was Father's Day weekend, and they hiked near the Tennessee-North Carolina border, a Martin family tradition. William Martin, Dennis's father, and Clyde, his grandfather, and the two boys started at Cades Cove and hiked to Russell Field, where they camped overnight. Afterward, they made their way to Spencefield, where they met another family with young boys, also named Martin. It was late in the afternoon, and the boys were enjoying each other's company. Dennis was wearing a bright red shirt when he and his brother, along with two boys they just met, planned a prank on the relaxing adults in the Spence Field area along the Appalachian Trail. The boys weren't especially sneaky with the prank. The goal was to hide behind the adults and pop out to surprise them. However, the adults knew what the boys were up to. A pincer movement was afoot. They watched as three of the boys went one way to sneak back through the bush. They watched as six-year-old Dennis and that bright red shirt sneaked off in the other direction and, for all intents and purposes, off the face of the earth. The three boys performed their prank, all in good fun. When Dennis didn't pop out from another angle, William got up to look for him. He hadn't been out of sight for more than five minutes, but William's search quickly turned frantic. The father ran back up the trail toward Russell Field, hoping the boy had gotten turned around and had gone in the wrong direction. The others combed the area. Clyde eventually hiked out to the park ranger station, arriving after 9 p.m. By then, a massive storm had arrived, drenching the mountains in a massive rainfall and dropping overnight temperatures into the 50s. The next day, the search was hampered by two and a half inches of rain and dense fog. As word spread of the missing boy, a massive response grew. Over the next few weeks, the search party grew to an unwielding and counterproductive size. Boy Scouts, National Guard members, multiple rescue squads, and even a group of 71 Green Berets who had been on maneuvers in western North Carolina came and searched for the boy. Helicopters arrived as well. With so many searchers and volunteers tramping over the wet and muddy ground, any clue or scent that lingered after the massive rain was quickly lost. Dennis turned seven that week as searchers exhausted themselves to no avail. There were boy-sized footprints of someone wearing one Oxford shoe, like Dennis had, and the other foot bare. Family members said the prints were too big to belong to Dennis, and searchers were skeptical as that area had been searched by Boy Scouts previously who could have left the prints. A single sock and shoe were also found, but it was unclear if the shoe was the right size or type, or if it was the correct foot to correspond with the footprints. Those were essentially the only clues. The search for Dennis was the largest search in the park's history. Dennis was six when he disappeared and was never seen again, probably. A family from Carthage, Tennessee, was in the mountains that day looking for wildlife in Cades Cove, several miles from where Dennis went missing. They left without ever knowing about the search or the missing boy. Weeks later, when the father, Harold Key, learned about the search, He called the officials and reported hearing a scream and a figure running through the woods. News reports at the time indicated that Key's son thought the figure was a bear. Later they determined it was a disheveled man hiding in the bushes. It was definitely avoiding us, Key was quoted at the time. Officials discounted the connection because of the distance and the rough timeline Key provided. It was nearly impossible to think someone could have snatched the boy and carried him away to that spot. Still, many have seized on this reported sighting, along with dozens of internet-driven embellishments, as an indication that Dennis was carried off the mountain. Reportedly, Dennis's father believed the boy was kidnapped. At one point, a reward was offered for his safe return. Three main theories exist about what happened to Dennis. The first is that he became lost and perished from exposure or some other cause, likely during the first night. The second is that he was attacked by a hungry bear, or, less likely, a feral pig and carried off. The third is that he was abducted and taken out of the park by someone or something. April 1970, Highway 441, Great Smoky Mountains National Park. 
In the late spring of 1970, while traveling south between Gatlinburg, Tennessee and Cherokee, North Carolina on Highway 441, somewhere near the state line in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, we sighted a very tall, hairy creature. We were cruising down the road, wondering if we would see any bear, and as we rounded a corner, there was this creature coming from the right side of the road down a grade from some small trees and bushes that still had leaves. It moved across the road directly in front of us, and after entering the bushes on the left side of the road, angled off the same direction we were traveling. We could still see its head for a few seconds before it disappeared. I would guess the height to be somewhere in the 7-plus foot range. It had a very long stride and walked like a human, swinging its long arms with each stride. It covered the distance of 100 feet or so in seconds. It never looked at us. There were no noticeable features that stood out. It was tall, slender, smooth, clean, straight hair that covered the whole body, and its head just seemed to come out of the body with no noticeable neck. We were flabbergasted at the sight of it and tried to convince ourselves it was a bear, but we knew it could not be because of the way it walked and its height. No nose protruding, nor could we see any facial features, as it never even looked at us, nor showed any signs of us being there. We were cruising along probably around 45 miles per hour with almost no other traffic on the road that day. It happened so quickly that my wife never had time to pick up the camera in her lap and get a picture. I recently began working at an army hospital and befriended someone who had a very near experience with what I considered a juvenile Sasquatch. After 17 years, the night is still very vivid and etched in my mind. With the help of Google Earth Maps, I was able to find the exact spot that I had my encounter back in December 1997. It was just as I remembered and as I had described to my friend. It was December 17, 1997. My friend had wanted to take me to this spot that she said looked spectacular under a full moon. We reached the spot that had a clearing of deforested area to the right with a 45 degree grade. The road was cut against the mountain edge, and it was a spectacular view with a fresh coating of snow that had fallen. The section of the road had a landing cut at the end of the curve, and we backed up into the landing where we could see any oncoming traffic. We'd been there approximately an hour, and the cab in my truck had gotten a little too cold, so I turned on the truck and put the heater on. My friend had noticed something in the road when the windshield defrosted. We were staring at a full-grown male boar that was rooting through the snow on the edge of the road. This thing was huge, and it made me regret not having my rifle or bow with me. It was one of those chance of a lifetime to see something like that just 60 to 70 yards away. We were downwind from him, and we must have watched that boar root for about 10 minutes, when all of a sudden it sniffed the air and it was gone. It ran like it feared for its life across the road and up the left side of the mountain that had the same 45-degree grade going uphill. My friend and I both wondered what would have made it run like that. I turned the truck off and we listened for any kind of noise that could have spooked him. We both talked about what would have made it run away like that. She joked it was probably a black bear since they were common sightings out there. Maybe five minutes had passed when she peered out the windshield and pointed to the tree line and told me to look. She and I both thought it was a black bear, but with the tree line in the background, it was really hard to make out the shape. It wasn't until it was approximately at the same spot the boar was and it was standing upright that I really had to strain to see what I thought I was seeing. We were still downwind from the spot where it was standing and had not noticed us yet. It was standing upright, but it seemed to be looking at the ground as if tracking the boar. I watched it for a good five minutes and I tried to tell myself that everything in my mind was negating that it was not a black bear. First, black bears do not stand and rear up unless provoked or if they need the height to look at something in the distance. Second, if it does stand up, it does not walk a good 20 to 25 yards on two legs like this form did, coming out of the tree line at a 45 degree slope. Third, when bears rear up on their hind legs, their front arms and feet come forward towards the center of their mass, and this form had long arms that swung out at its side. As it stood over the spot where the boar had been rooting, I was staring in disbelief. Mind you, my friend and I had not been drinking and neither one of us smokes, so there was nothing in our systems that could have created this image. There was a complete full moon that was behind the form, so all I could really see was the outline of it, and I strained to see its face and form a little better. I reached to the left side of my dash and pulled on the light knob, and then the high beams. There stood a figure, approximately eight to eight and a half feet tall. I could see the steam of its breath as it folded its left arm over its face and blocked my high beam light from its face. 
It stood there frozen as if he was trying to figure out what was causing this light. It looked puzzled and tried to see between its fingers at my truck, but the lights must have really blinded it because it kept dodging its head back and forth to get a better look at us. We were at a stalemate. I was in disbelief at what I knew I was looking at, and it was in disbelief at these two lights that were peering at him from the darkness. He tried to move to the side, and the lights still bothered him because in an instant his face went from puzzlement to one of anger. I remember seeing his eyes. His eyes were this glowing amber-red color, and his brow was frowned, which only intensified more the longer the lights shined on him. He grunted, and the steam from his mouth was a great billow of smoke caused from his hot breath hitting the cold midnight air. It looked like he was going to take steps toward the truck, and I laid on the horn. I remember his body shuddering at the noise, and he turned toward the same general area the boar had run up. It took three strides for him to cover approximately 20 feet of roadway, and he reached up for the base of a small sapling, grabbed it, and propelled himself up the mountain, and in a matter of two seconds, he was gone from sight. I sat there almost in disbelief, looking up the side of the mountain where he vanished. My heart was beating fast, and I had these cold chills that scared me to the core. At this time, I looked over at my friend and asked if she had seen that. Her eyes were as big as saucers, her mouth was open and shaking, and couldn't make a noise. I reached over and touched her arm, and she pulled it back hard. It was at that moment that I realized she had urinated in her jeans, and she was afraid. Now let me tell you, this girl was a mountain girl, been hunting and fishing with her daddy since she was a little girl. She knew firearms, she knew how to hunt and fish, and could hang with the best of them. She knew how to skin a deer, baited her own hooks, and cleaned her own fish. She knew how to rough it out in the wild and had been on hundreds of hunting and camping trips. This was by no means a girl that would scare easily, ever. She never even looked at me. She just screamed to get out of there and take her home. I tried reaching out to her and she pulled away. I knew her enough to know not to try further and I started the truck up. When the heater started up, there was a stench that filled the truck cab. Something like strong urine and an odor of mixed sweat and a strong body odor. It was awful and made us both gag. I rolled down the window and the fresh air outside wasn't any better. It took about a mile or two with the window rolled down to get that smell out. I drove up to her driveway and she got out without saying a word, not a glance back or nothing. I drove home and didn't sleep that night at all. The following day, I grabbed my 30 6 my 9mm, hunting knife, some binoculars, and headed back to the spot we had been at the previous night. I found the same spot, but another dusting of snow had hidden any trace of the hog or the Sasquatch. I drove close to the road's edge, back and forth, still kind of scared of exiting my truck. I eventually parked on the side of the road and traced the trail that the boar and the Sasquatch had. My rifle in my hands with the safety off, my nine at my side unclipped, and with the safety off, and I was still uneasy. I walked back and forth and never found anything other than divots in the snow where he had walked, and even though I took pictures when I developed them, there was nothing conclusive. Thinking back now, I failed to measure the distance from one divot to the other, because there were easily three of my strides between snowed-in divots. I did find the sapling that he grabbed to catapult himself up the mountain, and it was broken at the base, but nothing there for me to collect. I must have sat in my truck for an hour or two, still in disbelief. I finally started up my truck and swore I'd never say a word to anyone, and to this date, I never had until I met someone with an incredible story like mine. A little background on me. I'm a Texas-bred and born man. I have hunted, fished, and camped all my life. I've taken down big game in Mexico, Texas, New Mexico, Tennessee, and Florida. I know what foxes, coyotes, wolves, deer, elk, and full-grown bears look like. I'm a former United States Marine, Desert Storm War era veteran. I'm the kind of man that would tell people I could walk up to the devil, spit in his eye, and ask him for a light. I'm not a glory seeker, as I could have been telling this story for years, but never have done so prior meeting this gentleman at work. He asked me to sit down and draw what I saw, and it was with amazing accuracy that I was able to draw everything I saw that night, including the eyes. The eyes burned and glowed in the night like two red hot coals peering from behind this massive hand. I will never forget the look of those eyes. Thanks for joining me on the Bigfoot Project. If you enjoyed today's video, here's one you don't want to miss. Also, if you have a story you'd like to share on this channel, email me, lynnsmith, at thebigfootproject at mail.com. 
I hope to hear from you soon.